first speaker this evening is Sarah Young, and she is, among other things, a professor at Mount Ida College in Newton. Um, and as fascinating as I'm sure that is, she's going to talk to us about what it is she teaches and another career that she has had. She is in the department of, what, let me get the name of it exactly right, the Department of Funeral Service Education at Mount Ida College. She is a funeral director, or has uh, had a career as a funeral director, and now she teaches this to other people. And uh, for our series here on Underground, she is going to tell us a little bit about the work that she does as a funeral director. Please welcome Sarah Young. So I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't a little hesitant um, when the producers reached out to me to come do this this evening. I did a little research after they reached out and kind of got a gist for what this program was all about and it seemed pretty lighthearted. And I was afraid I would come in talking about death and funerals and really just be a buzzkill for the evening. <laughs> So hopefully I won't do that. I will try my best not to. When they introduced the subject matter of underground, I thought this was actually a really good opportunity for me to come out and talk this evening. Um, death, as we all probably agree, is a rather um, taboo subject in our modern day society, at least in my humble opinion. We don't talk about it nearly enough. Um, it's a rather scary thing for a lot of people, and I, I don't think it really has to be. And the reason for this, at least in my mind, is this. If we go back 100 years, 150 years maybe, death was a relatively omnipresent thing. It happened at all ages, and not that it made it any easier. Grief certainly was still a very difficult thing, but people were more aware of it. If someone was ill, they didn't go to a hospital to die, they went to the home. And people who were at the home, the family members, cared for them and were actually seeing this as life went on. We fast forward to modern day society. If someone is sick, they go to a hospital. And we do everything in our power because of medical advances, which are wonderful, to keep them alive and with us. Um, but it's not uncommon for somebody to pass away at a hospital. If someone is aging, where do they go? oftentimes a nursing facility. Not because we don't care, it's not a cruel thing, we're just really busy these days. Um, and we can't take care of them, we have to work and go about our lives. So oftentimes they pass away at a nursing facility. So death is still happening, it's just out of our sight. Out of sight, out of mind, it gets very easy to not talk about anymore. So it is an underground subject. However, even though we're not talking about it nearly enough, I know for a fact that people really want to talk about death. And I know this because in the few instances I actually pretend to have a life and I get out in social situations where I'm meeting people who have no idea about my background, don't know that I'm a funeral director, and don't know that I teach this for a living. When you start asking questions, kind of the niceties, what's your name? And then of course the follow-up question is, and what do you do? And I have to think really hard for a second, how committed am I to this conversation? <laughs> because I am inevitably gonna answer that question in one of two ways. I'm either going to say I'm a funeral director, or I'm gonna say I'm in customer service. <laughs> Both of which are completely true, it's just that if I answer that I'm a funeral director, that immediately opens up the floodgates of questions, which I think is a wonderful thing. I've just created a safe space for someone to now talk about death. It is no longer taboo. She doesn't care. This is what she does for, does for a living. Um, she can answer all these questions, and I'm usually more than happy to do that. Um, so with that, I certainly can't answer all of those questions in the short time that I have up here today, but I will try to at least touch upon one of the questions that inevitably comes from pretty much every person I talk to that wants to learn a little bit more about my career. And that is, how did you ever possibly get into this? And I'm guessing they're asking that question because of three things. I am a woman. I also am going to hold on to this, although every year it's a little 
a bit less relevant, but I'm relatively young. <laughs> And they will come to find out, if they don't already know, that I have no family in this business whatsoever. So I am three things they did not expect to say that answer. Um, I don't really fit the stereotypical mold that most people would assume a funeral director is. So I wish I could say I had some sort of mind-blowing story, something in my childhood, very tragic, that happened, that, that brought me to this career path. And, I really don't, <laughs> it's not a super exciting story. Um, I went to college for something completely unrelated. I never considered this an actual career until the week before I graduated college. I don't know what I thought a funeral director was, I really gave it not much thought at all. Um, but the week I was graduating college, I will never forget it, I was packing up my dorm room and I flipped the news on and there was a very short documentary type presentation about this wonderful career path of funeral service. And it was showing students who were going to a mortuary program, which I also didn't know existed and that is required to become a licensed funeral director in most states. So with that, 10 minutes was a complete change in my life. Uh, I graduated, I enrolled in a mortuary program the next week, and that was the end of it. For the next 10 years of my life, uh, I found my home in funeral service as a funeral director and embalmer. I was lucky enough to be trained by um, what I will easily say is one of the most amazing funeral professionals that I will ever hope to uh, meet in my career. His name is Al Abdella, and he actually is, has joined me here today. Um, he is a huge reason uh, as to the person I am today and my love for this industry and this profession that I have, and to do it for the right reasons. Um, after 10 years, uh, I did not lose my love for the, the industry. I still very much cared about it and wanted to devote my life to it. But you get to a point in your career when you've been doing it for so long, you want something more. And that's when I transitioned into teaching. So I'm still connected to the business. I'm still connected to the death care industry. It's just that now I can work with students who want to do this in their futures, much like me many of which, in fact the majority of which these days are women, the majority of which do not have a history um, or a family in funeral service, and I can work every day to help them learn what I had learned to be doing this. So um, I consider myself, it, obviously it's a rather unique career path, but one of the luckiest people to get to do what I do, because I'm in the classroom and I can also talk about um, the death care industry, which I am so passionate about. So anyway, um, if nothing else, uh, if I've accomplished nothing else here tonight, my hope was that I can at least open the discussion up to say that this is something we should be talking about. It's something, unfortunately, we're all going to have to deal with and go through at some point in our lives. It sucks enough already. So talking about it beforehand helps us gain a little bit of comfort um, and make it not such a scary topic. So hopefully I've been able to at least accomplish that and I'm certainly happy to answer questions that you may have. I'll kind of mingle afterwards, I guess, and we'll see if Craig has questions. I, I definitely have questions. <laughs> you said when you tell people what you do, they always have like, all these very intense yes. questions and that's exactly what I want to do right now, if you'll forgive me. Yes. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I mean, it strikes me that um, the thing about your career choice is it, it, it seems, I think, to the average person like it would be a very, very hard job. And you said when we were speaking before that it's actually fun. It's a lot of fun. Like, how, how is it so fun? Like, what, what's fun about your job? I think because of the nature of dealing with other people's grief all day, and, and you do see a lot of things that you, you wish you didn't have to see. You see people go through situations that you wish, in some cases, you could take away from them, um, because it's just not fair. You deal with a lot of that, and that itself is, is not the fun part. But you learn, uh, at least in my experience, my own personal experience, 
is to kind of compartmentalize those feelings. You have to know when to turn on and turn off. So when you're not dealing with that right in the moment, I think you kind of balance that off by having a whole lot of fun when you're kind of off the job or away from the families in order to make sure that, sh that you know you can kind of keep it together. So just stay sane? Well, none of us are sane, <laughs> absolutely not. But in order to do our job, we need to be obviously level-headed. That's what we're there for. We're helping people who are um, distraught and grieving, and their job in that moment is to go through the grief process, which is an incredibly difficult thing. Um, we're there to handle all of the, the details and the paperwork and all of the things that they shouldn't have to be focusing their energy on. So in order to do that, yeah, we have to have a lot of fun when we're not on the job. But it does seem like basically your job is to deal with maybe the two things that we try to avoid the most, uh, which are grief and dead bodies. Um, right? I mean, like... I don't try to avoid that. But yeah, <laughs> I know. I like the, the rest of us, though. I mean, like, I, I, starting with the grief, though, you, you, you mentioned it there. I mean, it must... Is it... Are there... Is it hard to deal with that day in and day out? I think, it must for the most personally part... personally affect you. If, if we took home every death that we dealt with, we would absolutely be crippled. Um, it's, it's not possible. If, if you've can't separate things, you, you will not be, uh, I don't wanna say good at this job, but you won't have a longevity in this career path. But we are human. There are ones, uh, families that we work with, deaths that hit us uh, harder than others, and you do go home with that grief from time to time. But you learn very quickly that you can't do that with every family that you work with, because otherwise that we'd be crippled and we can't do the job that we need to do for these families. Um, the ones that hit you, it, it depends on um, you know, who you are, but maybe it's, it's unfortunately something like a child or someone who um, is your own age, something you can relate to. That's been my experience or the ones that you, know, you do have a connection to and it, and it does take a little bit of you, uh, you know, from your job and you take that home. And, and of course, I'm not letting you off the hook on the other part of it. Uh, the dead bodies part uh, is something that um, uh, is, I think, probably a, a topic of morbid fascination with most people who ask you about your job. I guess, can I ask, essentially, like, I mean, you're actually doing that yes. stuff, right? Yeah. You are embalming the, 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 uh, the bodies that come to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess the question is, like, can you explain? Kind of explain it to us a little sure. bit, like what is done. And then secondly, you know, when you started that, was that a difficult thing? I mean, it seems like were you ever creeped out by that? Um, never, uh, never. And and the I irony of it is, before I got into the funeral industry, I had never really had much experience with seeing uh, funerals or deceased bodies, anything like that. Um, the reason that took that question took me back when you asked me in the green room was. I don't, I think about it a lot because it's what we do, but it's such a small part of what we do. Working with the living is really what I consider my job to be, not so much working with the deceased. Yes, it is a part, it is an, a necessary evil, if you will, something that we have to do, and it is also an important part of what we have to do, but it's, it's a small part, so that's why it kind of yeah. took me aback. Um, as far as the embalming process go, that, that's normally someone's, um, one of their first questions because it is something. We don't see it every day. What is it? Um, it's a relatively simple process in most cases. If a family requests it, and it's appropriate because it's certainly not something for everyone, um, that allows for the temporary preservation and to make someone um, have a good memory picture of their loved one. Um, and again, it's not something we do every single time. It's just at the request of the family and when it's appropriate, so. Um, lastly, I just wanna ask a little bit about, um, if, if you've seen any changes, I'm wondering if people are still having open casket funerals in the same, the same way they used to, right? Mm -hmm. Have we seen any change over time? Are, are, oh, yeah. What changes are you seeing in how people are addressing death and, and those kind of arrangements? Sure. 
Our industry, just like any other industry, goes through changes. We have consumers or families that change preferences, um, what works for them. We're definitely, I think, industry-wide seeing um, less of um, traditional services, but that's simply being replaced by less traditional services. I think the need to memorialize our loved ones will never go away. That is not going to change. We want to remember the people that we cared about in life um, and celebrate their life. Uh, so there, yes, there have been changes, um, but I, there will always, in my opinion, be a need for people to help at the time that a death occurs in whatever way that may be, whether it be with open casket, no casket, cremation, burial, whatever those services are, um, there'll be people that are needed to assist those families. It does seem like an area with great, uh, uh, with great professional security. Uh, the people are always going to die, they're gonna need your help. So, all right, great. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Sarah Young, everybody. Okay, thank you. In continuing with our theme of underground for this evening, we have an entirely different kind of underground experience for you. We have an underground rapper from right here in Boston. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Brandy Blaze. Can I ask you, for anybody here who's not familiar with your music, to uh, describe it for us. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Okay, so, um, like it was said, I'm a local hip-hop artist, underground artist. Um, my music, I like to call myself a trap feminist. Um, so what that means is I believe in feminism, especially womanism, wholeheartedly. However, I am also originally from Dorchester, um, so I still have very much a hood aesthetic, because that's where I'm from, and that's what I represent. And a lot of times in feminism, um, poor women, and especially women from neighborhoods like where I'm from, aren't really represented in mainstream feminism. So my music is very much a representation of that, um, empowering myself as a woman, empowering other women and femmes, um, but also still keeping that aesthetic that is true to me. And you're doing it in an environment that is very male dominated, right? I mean, yes. <laughs> how, in, in Boston, or really in hip hop in general, but specifically in the scene that you're in, uh, how common are women rappers? Um, Overall, women rappers are not very common. I will say in Boston, it is a little bit different. Um, I personally know several amazing, incredible female rappers from here. Um, Dutch Rebel, I'm a huge, huge fan of her. Um, Oompa, um, Miss Jack, Capella, Mona Valley. Um, there's a lot of amazing, incredible women that can rap, like really rap that are from here. Um, and I think that kind of makes Boston unique. I don't really see that too much other places. Wow, okay. That's great to hear, actually. Is there something different about the scene here that actually is more conducive to, to women rappers? Um, I think the scene is smaller. That's number one. <laughs> but I think that kind of also leads to a lot of us knowing each other. And we're able to cultivate a lot of relationships and friendships. We're able to, you know, do collaborations together and work together. And that leads to more women being more prominent here. Like you could very easily do a show here that's all female rappers. And it would probably, we could probably sell it out, sell out a venue very easily with an all female rap lineup and it would be incredible. It would be heavy hitters every single set. It would be no downers. It would be no fillers. It would be amazing. Maybe we should get them on this stage here at WGBH. That sounds like a pretty good show. It sounds like a really good show. Um, so tell me actually about the scene here in Boston. You, you referred to it as small, but I mean, it's like really small, right? It's, it's it, compared to other cities this size. Like, what's it like here? It's very, very small. Um, like I said, a lot of us do know each other, interact with each other in some capacity. Um, it could be very difficult here too. 
Um, Boston isn't a city that's really known for having a huge hip hop scene, but also we as a scene and a culture deal with a lot of barriers from making this more of a destination for hip hop. Um, we have to deal with the venues that don't wanna book us. Um, we have to deal with promoters that want to charge us to perform, which makes no sense. So we have- You should be paid to perform. <laughs> right! <laughs> so, so and I'm good! Tell us how that works. I mean, you actually, you actually have to, if you wanna do a show in Boston at a venue, it can cost you money to perform? Absolutely. Um, I think it's very, one thing would be if I am booking a venue myself, so I pay the venue, and then it's my show, I do everything I wanna do, I'm selling the tickets, I'm doing everything, right? That's one thing. Um, but the main thing that happens that I've come across a lot is you will have promoters that do pay to play. So they'll be like, you know, DMX is coming to town or whatever. And if you want to open for DMX, you need to give me $300. Now the set is going to be probably two to three hours before DMX goes on. DMX probably isn't even in the building. Like they just opened the doors. They're still cutting limes at the bar. You know what I'm saying? They're still setting up. There's nobody there. So you just gave this promoter $300 for what? Or even if it's an all local event, they do the same thing, which is what they'll be like, give me, a hundred to three hundred dollars, and then here's some tickets you could sell. Now, the thought process is you could sell these tickets and make your money back, but that doesn't make any sense because the promoter's job is to sell tickets. Yeah, that's what they're there for. I'm the artist. My job is to look good and give you a good show. Yeah. And that's what you should be paying me to do. <laughs> that it's, that it's kind of my. Is, is it like that in other cities, or is it is Boston particularly bad at this? Um, I do have, um, I had a friend that I was talking to um, in Chicago. She knows a lot of promoters who we were talking about this pay to play and she had never heard of it. She said, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I was just in Atlanta in January and literally just kind of went to the venue. It was like, I'm here. <laughs> and went to perform full venue. You know what I'm saying? And I got a lot of support and a lot of great connections from that. Um, that's not to say that there's not places like that here. Um, there's definitely a lot of crazy, incredible open mics here, especially if you are a new artist that's trying to work on your craft, trying to um, build up um, a following, trying to you know work on your stage presence, those things, um, which are amazing. I hit up a lot, I'm at open mics like every month. I love open mics and um, especially there's a fantastic one at Suya Joint every month that um, I live for. Um, another one at um, Bella Luna that I go to usually every month. So I love open mics, I'm not opposed to it. But it gets to the point where it's like, what do I do now? Because I'm, you know, I hate to toot my own horn, but I am a polished act. I have a finished product. I have an entire mixtape out. I'm working on my second one. I have videos out. I'm on, you know, my music is on streaming services. So then where do I go after I've paid my dues, which is what you have to do as an artist. But what do I do after that? Do you leave Boston? I mean, is that, is that the answer for a hip hop artist in Boston who, you know, pays their dues here to, to be a success? Do you just have to get out of this town? A lot of people leave. I'm just gonna be very honest. A lot of people leave. It's something that I'm seriously considering myself. Like maybe I do need to go back to Atlanta where I know that there is a robust hip hop scene and I can get support. But I love Boston so much. I'm the third generation of my family born here. I know so many incredible artists here. Like there's a Kanye West here. There's a Jay-Z here. There's a Nicki Minaj here. There's all those people are right here and I believe in it so much that is kind of like, do I be selfish and say, you know what, I gotta go and just focus on my own? Or do I stay and try to work with the people that I believe in and really try to cultivate this and make it happen from here and for Boston? So it's, it's a tough decision to make. I'm still working on that. Still something you're trying to figure out? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, you mentioned that hip hop in general and, and certainly the hip hop scene here in Boston is very male dominated. And you know, looking at watching your videos and listening to your music, I feel like uh, it's sort of reflected in your work. Um, 
I, the, the word I would use would be assertive. It's very <laughs> assertive. That's a very, very polite Is way that an to way? put what I do. But yes. Well, t explain, t tell people what, 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 what's a, another way of putting it. Um, probably, I'm shocked that I'm sitting on this stage because I don't make music for PBS. Let's put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> for my music to go on the radio. Um, and shout out to a lot of the local stations. I've gotten a lot of support here. I've had records played on the radio here. Um, they're very heavily edited. Yeah. That's another nice way to put it. <laughs> From what I heard, they'd have to, yeah. Um, is that, I mean, do you think, uh, is that a reaction to, to some degree to the scene that you're in, right? Do you feel that you uh, are, are um, your lyrics and your rapping and, and your subject matter is in any way a reaction to the, the, the male-dominated scene that you're in? Um, yeah, um, it's a reaction to the male-dominated scene, but my music is also very, very personal to me. So everything that I'm going through, like my first mixtape is called Spinster, um, all of the songs on there are very, very personal to me. So I have a record like, um, probably my most popular record is a song called Boss Like Me. Um, and that song is very much about, like you said, being assertive and showing your dominance as a woman and showing that, yes, every day I wake up, I am a boss and I run everything, especially when it comes to my career and my image, I run everything. And I think that that's important no matter what field that you're in. But then I also have songs like Thank Me, um, which is about um, my ex-boyfriend, um, my last relationship that I was in. And I went through a lot of painful things in that relationship, and that song kind of reflects that. So you kind of get that balance of, you know, let's turn up, let's have a good time, because I nothing I love more than a good turn up record, right? <laughs> but also showing that more vulnerable side of me and so that people can connect with me in all different lanes. I also heard a lot about uh, you basically demanding respect of men. You, you have to, period. When you walk out the house as a woman, you have to. That's just life, no matter what job that you're in, but especially um, like myself and all these, you know, my fellow amazing speakers, we are all women that are in male dominated fields. So all of us have to come in and demand respect from the beginning. And that's something that I really had to work on because on stage I'm Brandy Blaze and I have this big bravado. But anyone that actually knows me knows I'm really chill and I'm really nice and polite. And <laughs> I kind of have to sometimes be Brandy Blaze off the stage. And that's something that I'm not always comfortable with, but it's something that I have to do. Because I think Nicki Minaj said, um, she went to a photo shoot, and you're, if I go to the photo shoot, and I know that I deserve um, top shelf, you know, refreshments, but they serve me pickle juices and pickle slices, and I accept it, then I'm setting that precedence for myself and for other women that it's okay to do that to me when I know you wouldn't do that to a man. So when I come in from the door, sometimes I really do have to be extra tough and extra hard. It's not something I personally enjoy, but I have to do it because I've had those experiences where, with men where they're like, well, you wanna do this show or you want this beat or you wanna be on this song, what are you gonna do for it? I'm like, I'm gonna be Brandy Blaze for it. What are you talking about? You called me, <laughs> not the other way around. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. <laughs> You kind of have to make it very, very clear. I don't play that from the jump. Yeah. And, but that's, that's all of us, unfortunately. And you mentioned actually a moment ago something that I love, which is that, uh, so you're, what, what you're like not on stage is not necessarily your stage persona. In fact... I think I was pretty nice to yeah, you, right? I think you've been very <laughs> sweet. You've been very sweet. It's much nicer than I expected based on the videos I saw. But Blaze is your stage last name. It's not actually your regular last name. And you have some day jobs that are unrelated yeah. to, to your work. Completely unrelated. Which are complete, and, and, <laughs> and, and the two worlds don't mix. Absolutely not, um, ever. They don't know that I rap, so. <laughs> Keep, you ever see me and you're like, oh, she has an afro and no makeup on? I'm working. So just say hi, Brandy. 
and don't say nothing else, all right? <laughs> if I got a wig on and makeup, it's okay to say, hi, Brandy Blaze. <laughs> when was the last time you've been an actual superhero, right? That's what we got here on stage here. She's got a secret identity, and we're getting the secret identity here tonight. Um, that's great. Um, so, uh, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you about, it kind of brings it back to the theme for a second here, is the underground thing. You actually celebrate in your work, like in the lyrics, being an underground artist. What does it mean to be an underground rapper? Um, for me, being an underground artist means freedom. Um, everything about my career, I'm a part of a collective that's amazing. Um, we're called No Muzzle Entertainment, started by a credible rapper named Hush Harding, myself, Mike Ross, Donna White, uh, my brother right here, Sandal Films, best videographer in the state. Um, <laughs> but other than that, everything that I have done, I have done on my own. I'm my own manager. I, I write every single thing that I spent. I don't have anyone else writing for me. People love to w ask women that. Don't know why. <laughs> but being an underground artist for me is just freedom. I could do whatever I want. And also, I'm a plus size black woman. So I don't look like, I love Nicki Minaj. I love Cardi B. I'm huge fans of their work, huge fans. I don't look like them though. And for a male rapper, you can look like anything, you know? You can be the swamp monster, no one really cares. As long as you can rap or you got a good beat, no one cares. For me, you have to be, you know, I am a light-skinned black woman, so I guess that's a plus. We'll get to colorism later, but <laughs> um, I don't look like, I don't have that curvy video model body with the tiny waist. I'm a big girl, and I have that freedom to just be me and let people see me be me. And I don't have a label or anyone telling me, you need to lose weight, or you need to rap about this, or you need to work with this producer. I could do whatever I want. And that's what I love about hip hop. Is, is there though, like a, a sort of a back and forth, like it, you have this freedom to, to do and be whatever you wanna be, and that's great, but you'd also probably like a really big fat record deal, right? Um, I don't or, is, or not, like is that not? I really don't want a record deal. Um, I would prefer a distribution deal so that um, that way I could keep my independence. Um, Chance the Rapper is a big role model for me. I want my independence because the only way that this is going to work for me is the way that I'm doing it now, which is just being me and looking the way that I look and saying whatever I want to say. I can't compromise that in any way. To me, at that point, it's not worth it anymore. As an artist, I have that type of integrity where I can't change this. This is what it is. So I really want a distribution deal so I can have that financial backing where I could take this further out and spread it. And the people are either going to like it and it works or they're going to hate me. And, but I still have a day job, so I'm still good. <laughs> well, I know you said that your, uh, your work is not usually a PBS uh, style. But I don't know about you guys, but I'd love to hear just a little bit of it. All right, I'm not going to go too crazy because, like I said, <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> um, but this is um, one of my favorite records to perform. It's a song called Scandal, okay? So, all these wild thoughts going through my head. From a city with the plain clothes will shoot you dead. Catch it with the blunt, they run up on you like the feds. Make it seem like you was wild and crazy off your meds. Pop your 10 times, pretend like they was right. And your fam gets no justice, Bo Ramsey White. Finally sprouted wings, but too scared to take flight. Just trying to catch that breeze like a kid's kite. Uh, got the bum dude all in my pockets. Whisper in my ear, daddy love me, please stop it. Close I come to a heart is my locket. Got no sympathy for dudes, please check my dockets. Oh, they good for that explosion like a rocket. And most of them can't even do that. Useless like some bull's tits. Messing up my picture perfect like some zits. Been out my mental, can't get the grip. Make these dudes walk behind me like a pimp. And that don't make me a pimp, it just makes me a woman that's fed up with the bullshit. Empty like I led up a full clip. Dude brought me a cause bag like that's gonna make me wanna claim him. Nah, dude, I'm still gonna smash you. Then I'm a dip. Now he crying like a uh, saying I'm a trip. All alone when I drive through. Bust the mask, they can help when I come through. 
They say you're way too much to handle. Big breedy chick running shit now. That's a scandal. Brandy Blaze, everybody. Brandy Blaze. That was awesome. This one is kind of amazing. Uh, Jade Lewis is an archaeologist. Uh, she's completing her PhD at Boston University. And get this, her research focuses on 19th century brothels here in Boston, and she's researching them by digging up, or rather looking at what she finds in outhouses, old outhouses from the 19th century brothels. Please join me in welcoming Jade Lewis. So when I usually tell people that I'm an archaeologist, if they don't ask me about dinosaurs or aliens or gold, um, initially they'll assume that, oh, you must work in Egypt or, you know, in Mexico or something. And I say, I'm not really one of those types of archaeologists. Uh, I think privies are really pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Which is a surprising thing, I think, for a lot of people. Um, and the reason that privies, though, are really cool to historical archaeologists, which is the type of archaeologist I am, is that uh, for a long time, before you had municipal trash pickup, uh, if there was an available hole someplace nearby, you would dump your garbage into it. And so you get these massive accumulations of trash, essentially. And I hate to break it to you, but archaeologists 98% of the time study trash. Um, stuff people threw out, they lost, they didn't want. Um, and you can learn a whole lot about people's lives based on essentially what they're throwing away. Um, so the privy that I am doing my dissertation work on um, is I didn't actually dig it up. I, I do dig in the dirt, but in this particular case, this was dug up during the Big Dig project, um, for those of you non-locals, when they put the central artery underground. Um, if you're familiar with the North End, if you're not familiar with the North End, get thee to the North End, it's awesome. Um, but if you're familiar with the North End, the Rose Kennedy Greenway, kind of the northernmost end where the uh, freeway goes underground, uh, around in the air is where this privy was. Um, and that particular area, um, the privy was associated with a brothel. Um, this brothel was active from about 1853 to 1867-ish, um, and uh, it had three different madams during that period. Um, Mary Adams, Louisa Cohen, who was the longest running, and Mary Lake. Um, and in this privy, which was probably filled in sometime after Mary Lake left, um, there was basically everything you can imagine that a household would have used. Um, there was stuff related to food, there were um, items related to clothing, um, there was a ton of different shoes. Uh, and the shoes are because when you get a privy, you seal it off and bacteria grows really slowly. Um, and so you get awesome preservation. So a lot of times you get textiles and other organic materials that otherwise would decompose. Um, so basically, uh, looking at this deposit, um, it was pretty much full to the top, and archaeologists um, decided that they would excavate this out even though it was outside of their permit. Um, the permit went up to 1830, um, but it looked really important, and so archaeologists volunteered their time, um, excavated out this privy in about 1993, and uh, I was able to use that collection, just all nice and clean and pretty, uh, and uh, uh, putting together kind of a story about the women who worked here. And that's one of the reasons why I really love historical archaeology, is that you're able to access not just uh, the objects that come out of the ground, but also um, documents, photographs, um, all sorts of different interesting things that can tell you a lot of detailed information about the people that you're looking at. Um, and that's really what um, I took away from this particular project, is just how much detective work it took to get into the lives of these women. Because that's what I really was interested in understanding. Um, in the historical record, you don't get a whole lot of um, discuss discussions by women in sex work about what their lives were like day to day. Um, and those that you do, there's questions about whether, they're not, whether or not they're actually written by these women, or if they're you know, more written as titillation and fiction. Um, 
And most of the literature you get is kind of dominated by um, moralizing either we must save these women or they're evil and we must, you know, do something about them. And so I wanted to know about these women and what their lives were like. And so a couple things that were really interesting that I found is when you think about um, brothels in the 19th century, I think we all have kind of the stereotypical image of what that looked like. And as far as this particular brothel, which was located on Endicott Street at 2729, um, you don't see it turning up really in the police records or um, arrest records or anything like that, unlike North Street, which was kind of where the red light district was, which is constantly getting raided and it's loud and raucous and that's where the sailors are going and that sort of thing. And so in this brothel on Endicott Street, um, while you'd expect to see evidence of a lot of heavy drinking and partying and that sort of thing, you actually see a lot of tea wares. Um, so you have this kind of change in image from, you know, people getting totally wasted at this brothel and busting up the neighborhood to instead maybe sitting around in this kind of genteel parlor atmosphere drinking tea and having, you know, conversation of a very domestic nature, um, which is a kind of strange way to think about prostitution in the 19th century. Um, also, uh, we have this idea of painted women as uh, a stereotype of 19th century prostitution. And uh, you don't see a whole lot of um, cosmetics that come out of this particular site. So uh, these things kind of were surprising and changed a lot of the idea that um, we might have had. Um, but the detective work of looking at the documents and looking at the records was kind of the, one of the more rewarding things for me. Um, I ended up actually finding the uh, last will and testament of the longest running madam, Mary, uh, sorry, Louisa Cohen. There's too many Marys in my list here. Uh, <laughs> so Louisa Cohen. Um, and she actually died in 1865. She was only 27 years old, but she had been running the brothel since she was about 18. Um, very savvy businesswoman. Uh, she actually was able to buy her parents' property, and uh, they continued to live there and farm it without any worry about having to pay mortgage. Um, when she died, she left a ton of money, especially to her sisters, but her brothers got some money too. Um, and then a bunch of really um, fancy material culture. So you have silver chalices and diamond rings and necklaces and all her whole wardrobe of clothing and things. And um, her mother was very well provided for. She was this, the only living parent. Um, her brother was given kind of the farm and all the stuff in the farmhouse and $800 and that sort of thing, but only after the death of their mother. So he was kind of responsible for taking care of her for the rest of her life. And so there's this other idea that comes out of the reform literature from the 19th century that 19th century prostitutes, they would, you know, die alone after five years of illness and that sort of thing. And while there, that was something that happened, um, Louisa Cohen really kind of bucks that stereotype. Um, she did die very young. Um, I don't know what of, but she, when she wrote her will, she was of sound mind but feeble body. And, um, but it was clear that she was still, you know, very attached to her family. Um, they definitely benefited from her trade, uh, such as it was. And, um, and she actually returned to her family home to die and is buried right next to her mother. And it's really interesting. I traveled back to where she's from, Wells, Vermont, and uh, visited her grave and visited her family's um, farmhouse, which is still there. And to go from Boston with its hustle and its bustle and its noise, which is, would have been different noise, but still very hustle and bustle and noisy in the 19th century, to be in this place where nothing much has changed in the last 150 years, with the wind kind of blowing through the trees and the cows in the distance and that sort of thing, that this was kind of who she, where she returned to um, when she knew she was dying. And that kind of personal connection that I was able to form just from kind of her, her material culture and her um, last will and testament and the documents that I had from her, um, that's, that's really kind of what I do, why I do what I do. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I also brought a handful of artifacts from the privy. If you want to uh, touch them, handle them, look at them, uh, just come, up, come find me and I'm happy to. Tell, show you all about it. <laughs>
Lewis, Lewis, everybody. I have questions. Actually, okay. first, can you, can you show me what you brought? Sure. You're there? Thank you, Mary. <laughs> These things are delicate, right? So we'll be very careful. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a bunch of glass here, so. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll two hands. Okay, thanks. Um, so, yeah, so uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, the only maybe sexy artifact, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think of it as sexy, uh, <laughs> but there was a bunch of these little dealies, these uh, tubes, and they've got uh, this plunger here. They had a lead cap on them. What is this? It's a vaginal syringe. It was used for douching. Um, it would have been used just for general hygiene by women in the period, but I've uh, paired it with, I'm just gonna do that, um, this bottle, it's double bagged because it is extraordinarily pungent. Um, feel free to come up and take a whiff. Uh, <laughs> this is actually uh, copaiba oil, which is kind of a resin-based oil uh, from a uh, tree in Brazil, and uh, would have been used to either treat venereal disease or uh, induce an abortion, um, something like that, uh, prevent any sort of illness. So they would have been probably douching with something like this. Um, I don't know about you, not into that as an idea, especially since these tubes are made of glass. Uh, <laughs> but so those are kind of like the most prostitute-y thing that I have in the collection, I think. <laughs> um, uh, I also brought, uh, there's a bunch of these. Uh, these are little tiny lamp fonts. Um, they're called finger lamps. And I really think these are um, super evocative because you get this idea of rather than having a bunch of lamps standing on tables and stuff, people carrying lights around to maybe light darkened areas. And so, you know, you have this sense of travel through this brothel space and what it might have been like. Um, and then you have some toothbrushes oh. made out of bone, all carved what, what up. What kind of bone would this be? Uh, this I'm not sure of. Uh, probably some sort of solid long bone, maybe beef or something. Um, but carved up, polished up. Um, reusable. And then this is one of my favorites, just because I'm a bird lover. Um, there was a couple of different uh, these. These are actually seed cups that would have been placed inside a bird cage. And they're uh, blue glass. This one's blue glass. Um, so it's reflective. It's colorful. And then you have this idea of maybe there is a bunch of different bird cages of songbirds or canaries or something around that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Can I put you? Yeah. No, I have the same question about that seed cup that I have. Yeah. Anytime I hear from archaeologists, which is like, how do you know that's a seed cup, right? It's just like, it's like, a, you ever wonder, like, you hear, like, oh, we know that this is, and they recreate this detailed history of how something was used, and it seems like that, to me, would be the hardest part of being an archaeologist is figuring out what the heck these things actually were. Um, my job is a whole lot easier now that the internet's around. Oh. Um, I do a lot of identification. Mine too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do a lot of identification um, from uh, especially you know, auction houses, that sort of thing. Um, but things like the seed cup actually are advertised in 19th century um, catalogs and things like that. Uh, so you can get, you can look at it and go, oh, that's a the shape that looks like what I've got here. And um, this is actually the, the the base I've got, there's three other pieces that allow me to build up the side and get a better sense of that. But yeah, I'm, I'm a lucky archaeologist in that, um, as one of my colleagues says, my things look like things. Yeah. And so... Um, I guess it, yeah, it's easier when you're w doing something in a, an era in which there were catalogs. That's or photographs. Gotta, yeah, or That's yeah, also great. That's got to make a big difference. <laughs> wow, okay. So, I mean, um, I, I'm really curious about why you've decided to s focus so much of your research specifically on prostitution and, 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 and in this particular era. Like, was there something about it? I mean, you touched a little bit about the lives of these women, but was, that, was it that? I mean, why, why, why prostitutes in this era? Um, my family member has asked me that question all the time. Um, <laughs> uh, so I've always been really interested in the 19th century. I think the 19th century is a really weird period of history. Crazy things happen. Um, but one of the things that um, really always kind of fascinates me is these kind of uh, social-wide ideas of what womanhood and women were. And I've always been interested in women who kind of pushed against that in various ways. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I initially started thinking about what I wanted to do grad school-wise and research-wise and that sort of thing, I was looking for those women on kind of the periphery of good, you know, genteel society and whatever that means. Yeah. Um, and so kind of 
fell into looking at um, archaeology of brothels and prostitution. And then um, when I came to Boston University, I was still really interested in that. And uh, when I talked about it with my advisor, Mary Beaudry, who's actually here, uh, <laughs> she, uh, uh, she had mentioned that this collection was available and I, was, I could use it for my dissertation, which I was utterly thrilled by. <laughs> Um, and so, so they were yeah. digging up the big dig mm -hmm. and they just found like I, I, how do you you're just digging and suddenly <laughs> there's a there's a privy there there's an outhouse yes yeah, there's so a big hole in the ground with a bunch <laughs> of stuff in it so um, one of the main uh, things that archaeologists do if they're not academics is uh, something called cultural resources management archaeology um, where you actually go out to where there's going to be um, construction done on especially a governmental scale. Um, and so this was kind of a survey to make sure that nothing really important was going to be destroyed. And they were initially looking at um, these features where they were building out the old mill pond in North End, which is now like Bullfinch Triangle. Um, and then just happened to stumble across this privy because in a city as old as Boston, you have, it, it's a mess. If you look at it under, we peel back the layers of the city, um, just this palimpsest of all sorts of different time periods and features and things going through and drains cutting through it all and then you get 20th century utilities going underneath all of that. It's just a mess and so even if you're looking for just a specific time period or just a specific thing, um, oftentimes you'll run up against other things that you weren't expecting to find at all. And that's what happened here. Is it the nature of, of digging in Boston is you're gonna find stuff everywhere? Uh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, like I said, it's just so many dense populations have lived here for so long yeah. that it's just unavoidable. <laughs> right, right. And, and a privy is a particularly good way to find some of this stuff because people throw stuff down there, right? I mean, like, yeah. it's not... Um, I, I read a thing recently... You're not finding the things that we usually think about throwing down a privy. <laughs> you're finding cooler stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, what, what I've, the argument that I make in my dissertation is that uh, the stuff that's in this privy is probably representing um, when the last madam, who also happened to marry a, a quack physician who was probably providing treatments to the women working at her brothel, um, when they left uh, in think around 1876 or 77, um, they probably left a bunch of stuff that they couldn't sell because the stuff in the privy is not very fancy. It's, it's pretty junky, um, <laughs> but it, it's a good representation of you know, what they were using. Um, but it, what it looks like is people went through cupboards and closets and that sort of thing. It took buckets of things and just dumped it down because it takes, I, I read something about like 40 wheelbarrows worth of dirt to fill in a privy. And why would you find that much dirt when you have all of this other detritus that you otherwise can't get rid of lying around your house. Um, so it's probably representing um, either some, some sort of house clean out. Um, they put it down the convenient hole and then packed it in with dirt around it. <laughs> Don't try this at home. For, for you, that is a gold mine. I mean, yeah. like, that's the kind of stuff that, that you know, you're living for, right? <laughs> yeah, surprisingly enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, outhouses are my jam. <laughs> Is that a surprise to you that you wound up going down this path in your own career? Um, no, I've always really been interested in history, and when I found out that I could, you know, touch it and do things with it that didn't totally rely on just the documents and what the documents said, um, I was totally hooked. Yeah. <laughs> What have you learned about these women um, and their lives that's most surprising to you or that you were most touched by? Um, well, definitely uh, kind of Louise's story was, I, I, didn't, I knew probably some of the least about her until I found her well. Um, and so to find that she was so connected to her family up until her death um, was something very touching to me. Um, and then the... Unfortunately, I still don't know much about Mary Adams. Surprisingly, Mary Adams is a really common name in 19th century Boston. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, Mary Lake, who became Mary Paddleford, um, I was able to find a ton of information about her life before she came uh, to Boston. Uh, she probably had a child out of wedlock who then later joined her. Um, she uh, had married this quack physician, William Paddleford. 
It looks like his financial situation was not terribly secure, and that might have had something to do with why they left um, Endicott Street. Um, but uh, he died in about 1888, and then um, when she died, uh, she was buried in Malden, but she didn't have enough money at that time to afford a headstone. So I visited her grave, but I just have it in reference to other stones around her. So, you know, that's something that, you know, me as a researcher who is so deep within this material, and, you know, f I feel like I'm, you know, family member of these women at this point, to, to see something like that was something very emotional for me. Um, so, so that sort of thing is always surprising. <laughs> L lastly, can I just ask, sure. I mean, the, the women that you're, you're looking into their lives here uh, and, and really uncovering who they were and what kind of lives they lived, have you been able to tell, I mean, were they people who did this profession by choice? They were, these, these were not trafficked women? These are, these are people who made a decision that this was their best option? You know, it's, it's difficult to tell from the record, um, but what I think I interpret from what I see is that it appears to be um, primarily choice. Uh, it was one of those professions that was the best way to make money as a woman in the 19th century. Um, and uh, there, there wasn't a whole lot of, if you were, if you were a poor woman in a city, um, there wasn't a whole lot other than kind of social stigma that was gonna drive you away from it. Um, but uh, I actually do see a link between um, Louisa Cohen and Mary Lake, later Paddleford, um, where she actually appears in the 1865 census as one of the um, prostitutes under Louisa Cohen. And she actually has a mention in Louisa Cohen's will. She receives a gold cross as a bequest. She's the only non-family member to receive a bequest. So you get this, in, this sense that there's some sort of kind of ladder that you climb professionally, or possibly climb professionally. Um, Unfortunately, with um, sex workers in the 19th century, because it was an illegal trade in Boston, um, none of their names are real, none of their ages are real, none of their oh. places of, <laughs> of birth are real. So you have to use like 18 different sources to say, oh yes, this is definitely the person that I want. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes triangulate from neighbors who are not doing illegal things. And I go back and do my own family genealogy and it's like, wow, this is really easy. <laughs> You're a real detective. It's, it feels like detective work. <laughs> well, absolutely fascinating. Jay Lewis, everybody, uh, thank, thank you. you so much.